Uh, it's my pleasure to speak on limits for transcatheter LA closure. Uh, a couple of disclosures, I'm a consultant and proctor and I research, receive research grants from Boston Scientific and Abbott Vascular for LA closure devices. So when I was preparing this talk about limits with LA closure, I thought about, well, number one, does LA closure um, target, or, oh, there you are again, I'm kind of short, so <laughs> the pleasure in standing up on a stool. Um, so when I thought about, well, does LA closure eliminate all sources of stroke related to atrial fibrillation? And number two, um, how does it compare to the gold standard, uh, which is oral anticoagulation? What are the exclusion criteria, be it clinical exclusion or anatomical exclusion, and what are the complications related to LAAC? So number one, LA closure unfortunately does not prevent non-LA related thromboembolism. And we learned from autopsy and TEE studies that when thrombi occur in a setting of non-valvular AFib, in about 90% of cases, they do reside in the LAA, but there's still the remaining 10% uh, that reside in the left atrium that LAA closure does not target. In addition, there can be other sources of stroke in patients with AFib, such as you know, clot or atheroma from the ascending aorta or carotid disease, and those are not targeted, obviously. So what about comparison to the current gold standard of first-line therapy, which is NOAC? Uh, well, we do have data comparing Watchman to Warfarin, as you know, from Protect and Prevail, and it does have pretty good comparative results in terms of being non-inferior and even superior, but where is the data comparing to NOAC? Well, there is none. Uh, there is a current ongoing study called the PROG-17 study, which is funded by the Czech government. It's currently ongoing. It's a multi-center prospective randomized trial comparing um, LA closure with any device uh, to versus NOAC, and this is only a 400 patient study. I think they're just over halfway done. Uh, but if you look at the primary endpoint, this study is really a composite of, of, a, of uh, both um, clinical endpoints and complications that includes stroke, systemic embolization, significant bleeding, cardiovascular death, and device-related complications. So I'm not sure what we can learn uh, that much from this 400 patient study. There's another study called the A3-ICH study, which is uh, planned uh, by the, by, um, in France. Uh, 300 patients will be randomized uh, to apixaban LA closure versus no anticoagulants for these patients with prior intracranial hemorrhage. And again, this is a small study, but I do think it's important to study this because currently uh, patients with prior intracranial hemorrhage constitutes a pretty large proportion of patients being treated with LA closure globally. What about exclusion for LA closure? If we look at the current indications here in, in the US, uh, Watchman is indicated of patients who are deemed suitable for warfarin and yet have an alternate uh, rationale or reason to seek a non-pharmacologic therapy. But coverage is a different story. As you know, for CMS coverage, you need a CHASPAS score of three, and uh, you have to be suitable for short-term warfarin, but not able to take long-term or anticoagulation, sort of putting patients into the relative contraindication realm. Uh, and in the rest of the world, uh, the guidelines from ESC would tell us this you know, therapy has its class 2B indication for patients considered contraindicated to oral anticoagulation. Uh, and when you look at ASEP2 study, which is a randomized trial comparing patients who are um, contraindicated to OAC to LAA closure with Watchman versus aspirin alone. If you look at the clinical exclusion, uh, I think we can learn from some of these exclusions. So these include history of percutaneous ASD or PFO closure, uh, patients with mechanical uh, valves, patients with severe heart failure, uh, class four, EF less than 30%, uh, patients with poor life expectancy, less than two years, and patients with hypercoagulable state. So there are also echo exclusion criteria. Obviously, presence of LA thrombus would be an exclusion. Even intracardiac thrombus elsewhere, intracardiac tumor, uh, patients with significant mitral valve stenosis, complex atheroma, we should consider as an, as an exclusion. So in aggregate, I sort of grouped them together. What are the patients we should think about excluding for LA closure? So those are mechanical valves, significant mitral stenosis, cardiac tumor, hypercoagulable state, poor life expectancy. I would say relative contraindication for percutaneous, previous percutaneous ASD PFO occluders because you can puncture your transeptal above, below, or even through these devices. Um, intracardiac thrombus, I said relative because even patients with LA thrombus, we have closed some of these patients when they don't have other alternative in terms of not being a candidate for LA for or anticoagulation. Uh, in, in, even in terms of LA anatomy, uh, this is even a lower proportion of patients will be excluded 
uh, because we have different devices uh, that are available. So what about procedural complications? So LA closure, I think, has really gone a long way in terms of uh, paraprocedural complications. So if you look at the initial experience, the first half of PROTECT, uh, these seven-day events of perforation, tamponade, stroke, device embolization, and basket complications was almost 10%. About half of those was due to tamponade. But in more in recent years, if you look at evolution, which is a 1,000 patient real world registry, primarily from Europe, uh, this comp seven day complication is down to 2.8%. And when you look at uh, the more objective complication, serious complication of pericardial tamponade, stroke, device embolization that requires surgical excision, and procedure related death, it's down to less than 1.5%. Even in the post approval US cohort, in the early experience here in the US as well. So we've really come a long way, but uh, for preventative therapy like LA closure, I think we can achieve even lower. What about with other devices? If you look at uh, M Amulet, which is the second device that's most widely used globally uh, for LA closure, in this registry of 1,000 patients, primarily in Europe, um, the seven-day major complication of stroke, systemic embolization, and cardiovascular death was also pretty low, 0.6%. When you add in bleeding complications like BARC-3 or greater bleed, device embolization or vascular complication, it goes up to 3.6%. Um, so relatively low, but I still think there is room for improvement. What about some of the longer term potential complications with device related thrombus and peri-device leak? Well, with peri-device leak, we know that with watchman is not infrequent. In fact, about 30% of these devices would have some degree of leak uh, at later follow-up. But significant severe leak, more than, one mil more than five millimeters, is actually pretty infrequent. That's less than 1%. Uh, and fortunately, in post hoc analysis, we have not seen interaction between the presence of residual flow versus clinical outcome. Likewise, with the ACP device and amulet device, period device leak, yes, occurs maybe about 12%, perhaps a bit less compared to Watchman. Severe leak, more than five millimeters, really is not existent with amulet. Between three to five millimeter leak, about 1% with the amulet. We've also shown that the presence of leak did not correlate to uh, thromboembolic events as well, which is reassuring. So the, the, um, the guidelines in terms of uh, when to survey for these peri device leak would be typically doing device surveillance imaging around six to 12 weeks with, with either TE or CT. And management really depends on how big the leak is. If you have a leak that's greater than five millimeters, probably most will agree that you should continue on anticoagulation long term or perhaps consider a second closure device. Now what about device related thrombus, and I'll finish here. Uh, I think this really is the major Achilles heel of this device therapy is thrombus on these devices. And if you look at you know, the conglomerate of data, I pulled them into this table, you can see we have a lot of studies now that looked at um, the incidence of device related thrombus. With any of these devices out there, it's really somewhere in the range of three to four percent. And these are not benign. The associated strokes with these thrombus on device ranges from seven percent to 26 percent. So when you see these clots on the device, they have to be treated. I, I really like this study that was uh, published recently this year of, uh, from France, uh, from eight centers in France. They included 470 patients. The overall device related thrombus rate was 5.4% in that study. And when you look at the risk of stroke, when you have thrombus in the device, the hazard ratio was 4.7. So it's not benign. And when you look at um, the, the hazard ratio of getting thrombus on the device, if you are on depth therapy, your hazard ratio is 0.1. If you are on OAC at discharge, your hazard ratio is 0.25. And in this study in France, you know, the practice is very different because you know, outside of the US, a lot of patients getting LA closure are contraindicated. So if you look at what antithrombotic treatment therapy they received, 8% had no antithrombotic therapy, 36% were treated with aspirin alone, and the remainder, about half, were treated with depth therapy, and about half received OAC. But it just studied, this study just highlights that you know, if you're not treating a patient with DAP or OAC post-LA closure, you're probably not doing the best thing for this patient in terms of preventing device-associated thrombus. So there's no consensus on when to screen for device-related thrombus, but most of us would do at least one imaging, some would do two. Uh, so the first between six to 12 weeks and probably a second one at 12 months. If you see clot, uh, you, you really should intensify your oral anticoagulation or add an anticoagulation. In rare cases, in less than 5% of cases, you'll require surgical excision. So in summary, NOAC remains the first-line therapy for stroke prevention for patients with non-valvular AFib. We do need comparative data 
for LA closure versus NOAC. LA closure is not suited for all patients. Remember, it does not treat all non-related, non-LA related stroke. There are clinical ex and anatomical exclusion. Uh, we need to continue to strive to lower the complication rates for this procedure, and we need further refinements in device designs and implant techniques and antithrombotic therapy to really lower the incidence of leaks and thrombus. Thank you. Jackie, I have a quick question. I know you have to leave about ASAP2 patient enrollment. You know, theoretically, ASAP2 and commercial indication of Watchmen should not overlap. But there is a gray zone in the clinical practice where a patient may not be an ideal candidate, but centers may choose to do a commercial Watchmen with DAPT as right. an off-label. How do you consent a patient, or how do you screen the patient in clinic when you're seeing for the first time, and you're trying to get it, him or her in an ASAP2, whereas a neighboring hospital may be sending flyers for like an off-label commercial? Right. I think the mindset care. has changed a little mm -hmm. bit. I, I think the ASAP2 is an incredibly important study, and, and the FDA really pushed for that, because that, that really will help us expand our all uh, indications for this procedure, hopefully to class 2A even, you know, in the national guidelines. So we really should strive to enroll patients. Right now we're only about 20% complete in terms of enrollment of 888 patients. And I think if you, if you see a patient who meets the criteria for a contraindication, uh, you, you know, the first line would be, if you're a center with ASAP2, I think we should approach the patient for that first. Um, I think off-label use, obviously we can't stop off-label use, unfortunately. And uh, in, you know, in a center that does not is not involved in ASAP2, you know, I, I guess you don't really have an option for these patients. And and uh, so the, the option in, in these patients would be, what do you do? Would you send them to Lariat, or do you, you know, or you just leave them in aspirin, for instance, for stroke prevention? It may not be the optimal thing. So I think you know, you got to individualize it, and you got to depend on the centers. What do you have access to that? I know in Canada, because all patients. I'm considering for ASAP2, I have been implanting Watchmen's in the past, so it's actually quite challenging mm -hmm. to, to enroll our patients because my referring doctors have been sending me to do the procedure, now I tell them, well, you have a two-to-one chance to get this. Right. I mean, not every patient is suitable for ASAP2, right? It's because some mm -hmm. of them, uh, they may not meet all the anatomical criteria that we have, and, and some patients are just, you know, they just don't want to be involved with very rigorous clinical follow-ups, so you can right off the bat exclude them, then I can do them sort of outside of ASAP2, mm -hmm. but, but it's a challenging thing. I think globally we're having issues and challenges in enrolling patients, not just in the U.S., but elsewhere, in Germany too, so right. thank you. Right. Great, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Dr. Song. So, uh, Dr. Ali, uh, innovations that created the LAA therapy space. Hey. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Paul and the uh, organizers who invited me to speak today. Uh, they've given me the task of talking about innovations that created the left atrial appendage therapy space. Uh, I think this is a very important space and it's going to be much, much bigger than TAVA or even the mitral valve or tricuspid therapies. Um, so I'm going to take on a journey of how this came by. I have no disclosures for this talk. Uh, therapies to obliterate, exclude, or occlude the appendage are now fairly well established. Uh, we do know that the benefits have been proven in clinical trials and even in real world uh, scenarios. Uh, all devices that occlude the left atrial appendage have the same purpose, but were designed and developed differently. Uh, how did they evolve? I think the first thing to know about this is to identify that the left atrial appendage was very, very early identified as a source of thrombus. Uh, in the, a very seminal paper by Dr. Blackshear at the Mayo Clinic, uh, he looked at patients with uh, valvular and non-valvular atrial fibrillation and also with concomitant mitral stenosis, and he found that left atrial appendage was a site of thrombus in about 90% of patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation. Uh, prior to this, it was a mixed bag. So pinpointing the left atrial appendage as a site of thrombus for this very important uh, patient population was, was quite uh, uh, elegant. Uh, the other thing to know is the role of imaging. I think imaging is everything. TE still plays a major role in how we evaluate our patients and how we deliver therapies. I think in 1986, Ashberg and colleagues uh, reported detection of a left atrial thrombus using TE. 
and with improvement in T imaging, we had a better understanding of the left atrial appendage. Uh, so in 93, uh, there was uh, a paper that looked at the usefulness of multiplanar T for imaging a left atrial appendage. I, I think this opened up the space for further device uh, innovations. Now, the, the, uh, like with a lot of what we do in interventional cardiology, we usually have surgical therapies ahead of us. I think that Madden in 1949 uh, treated two patients with mitral stenosis and atrial fibrillation. Uh, they, they figured that these patients had emboli, emboli not, not strokes, but peripheral emboli, and they took them to the OR, uh, opened up the chest, did cardiac massage, and ligated the left atrial appendage. Uh, one patient died, one survived. Uh, so that led to uh, uh, a field where the surgeons started looking at ligating the left atrial appendage. Uh, you know, this could be done with several approaches, open, thoracoscopic, and, and uh, approaches. Now you could use a suture, staple, excision, or clip techniques. We know that sutures, staples, and excision have their limitations in, fa in, in the sense that they, they don't always occlude the appendage completely. And we also know that the artery clip or the clip technique has been very good in demonstrating efficacy. So the surgical left atrial appendage occlusion was definitely an uh, important step in innovation in this field. The LAO study was the first to document that surgery could be very favorable in these patients. When we talk about endovascular techniques, the first device on the market was a Plato device uh, developed by Dr. Michael Lesh. Uh, at that time, he was looking at atrial fibrillation. Uh, but he patented this device in 1998. It was a self-expanding balloon-shaped nightmare cage with device with multiple struts that produce an outward force, uh, ranging from 15 to 32 millimeters in diameter, and had a PTFE membrane. Now, it was achieved, stabilization was achieved by three rows of small anchors. It was a 12 French delivery system, and it could be repositioned, retrieved, and recaptured. These are the same things that we do nowadays. We can reposition, we can retrieve, and recapture our devices. So these very, very early fundamental concepts still remain today. Uh, there was a series of studies, uh, which was called the Plato study. Uh, this was one of the outcomes at five years, uh, published by Dr. Block at that time, and it showed efficacy. There was a reduction in stroke risk from 6.6% .6 to 3.8%. So there was definite efficacy with this device. Unfortunately, the device was taken off the market for financial reasons, so it never really made it to the market. Yeah, I think they didn't have enough money to do a large-scale randomized clinical trial. Uh, following the Plato device was the Amplata left atrial uh, appendage occlusion device. Uh, you know, the, it, was, it was quite an interesting story. Uh, Benny Meyer and Cort Amplats in 2002 looked at this. Uh, the Amplats ASO occluder was, initially, was being used for an ASD closure. And during the delivery of the device in the left atrium, the disc of the ASO device actually popped into the left atrial appendage. Uh, so they figured, well, if if we can actually put this into the left atrial appendage, this may be some form of therapy for the appendage occlusion. So the first thing man was done in 2002 in Bern, Switzerland, and they did a series using a pacifier technique. So they used an ASO occluder to occlude the left atrial appendage. But, you know, it was limited by several things. Number one, they had a high percent of, uh, 10 percent embolization rate because it was designed for the left atrial appendage. Uh, the mold of the device was inappropriate. This was an ASO device being used in the left atrial appendage. And the introduced sheath needed a distal curve to fit into the left atrial appendage. So it was quite cumbersome. They tried other devices on the market. Uh, none of them really uh, uh, worked. Uh, Cortan Platz at that time was, he was at that time retired, but developed a 2 by 45 degree out of plane sheath to help with this. Uh, that led to the development of the Amplata cardiac plug. Uh, which was now a dedicated left atrial appendage occlusion device. It was self-expanding, a night knob polyester patch. Uh, it was a double device with a lobe crowned by hooks and a proximal disc. Uh, and it came in eight different sizes. And this was quite useful for occluding a left atrial appendage. But it had its own limitations too. So based on that, they developed the current generation of what we call the Amplata AMOLED device, which had a larger lobe with more hooks and came preloaded. And the, the connector to the LA disc was recessed, so to uh, reduce the risk of thrombus adhesion to that uh, portion of the device. And they also redesigned the pusher cable at the end of the device. 
Uh, so this, this is in the current generation of the AMOLED device, which has uh, been shown to be effic efficacious in clinical trials and real-world scenarios. The Watchman device uh, came along in 2000, uh, developed by interventional cardiologists and engineers at Atritec. Uh, uh, early de designs were obviously very difficult, but they evolved over time. Uh, they, they wanted to have an open-ended digital design uh, with a semi-permeable fabric uh, to, uh, to enable the device to accommodate a wider range of sizes and uh, left atrial appendage anatomies. Uh, as you can see here, uh, you know, this is described as you know, uh, parachute, jellyfish, whatever you want to call it, but it's got a 160 micron membrane uh, with anchors that uh, uh, hook onto the left atrial appendage uh, wall. It's nitinol and it's got a large proximal face. Uh, this has also, also evolved now what we call the Watchman Flex, which is uh, currently in clinical trials. Uh, now we're going to replace the open distal face with a closed uh, 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 face, uh, a shorter device length, and this is supposed to be easier to deploy uh, and hopefully treat uh, bigger and wider anatomies. So I think the Watchman Flex will be another iteration of the Watchman device that will make it easier to use uh, these devices in the near future. Uh, I think the most important innovation of the Watchman is actually the amount of trials that we've seen uh, from the device. I think the Watchman uh, uh, device has opened up this space uh, with uh, a fair amount of randomized and non-randomized non clinical trials, and that's led to approval by the FDA. I think if you want to pick anything in the left atrial appendage space, the Watchman has led the way in terms of trial uh, design and uh, achievement of efficacy. Uh, I'll mention a LIRAT device here. Uh, this is the only suture-based um, uh, device uh, therapy on the market currently. Uh, we know it has three components, an occlusion balloon, a magnet tip wires, and a 12 French suture delivery device. We know it requires two uh, accesses, a dry pericardial access and a transeptal access, and uh, mimics the surgical suture closure. Uh, future devices on the market will include the Corex WaveCrest device, WaveCrest device, Oclutech, Cardia, and LifeTech, and there are other devices on the market uh, being, being tested. Uh, but the design com concepts are quite similar. They, they, a lot of them involve nitinol, they involve membranes, they involve hooks and big sheets. And retrievability and repositioning is essential. Hooks, wires, patches, various sizes, and sheets are essential part of a working LLA occluder. And that's what we do. Uh, this, this is a summary of where, we, where, we, where we've been and where, we, where, where we've come from, uh, from identification of left atrial appendage as a site of clot in most patients with non-valvular atrial fibrillation, to surgical closures in the, 90, in the 90s, to Plato, occluded occluder device, to the amplitude and the watchman. I think the future is quite bright. So in summary, I'll say that the evolution of the left atrial occluder space has been fascinating. A device continues to evolve as a search for the perfect occluder device. The space is poised to continue to be exciting and innovative for many years to come. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, we'll keep moving. Our next speaker is Dr. Pasala, who's going to talk about design needs for device occluders. Thank you, uh, both Dr. Carol and uh, Pradeep. Should I just move forward, I guess, here? Okay, got it. Uh, thank you for everybody who's still stick around the last day. So uh, my topic today is uh, design needs for cardiovascular uh, device occluders. I'm giving this talk on behalf of Dr. Ruiz. Um, I also, since the last two speakers spoke a lot about uh, left rate appendage occluders, I'm going to steer away from that. and. Uh, so also give you some insight about that. So I don't have any disclosures. Dr. Ruiz's uh, disclosures are uh, listed. So there are many uh, limitations to the currently available cardiac devices. Uh, if you look at them, they are mostly off-label. Uh, very few are on-label here. And uh, in this particular case, uh, which is a very large aortic PBL, uh, AVP2 devices are used. And as they took care of the problem, they created a new problem here, which was uh, LVOT obstruction. So those were retrieved and sort of uh, more of a ADO devices were used. So it's very difficult to predict uh, which one is going to be uh, useful and what kind of uh, devices are most beneficial to which kind of uh, defects you're going to cause. Uh, 
Um, so most of the cons with this device is one, as I mentioned, it's mostly off-label. Uh, and they're very abrasive. They're uh, made of nitinol uh, oven uh, structures. Uh, they can be um, cause uh, injury to in uh, adjacent structures, perforations, you're talking about corrosion in the long term. And also, uh, they can cause hemolysis as well. And any foreign body in the, uh, with is uh, increased risk of infection. And these uh, devices are no uh, exception here. And also, they're uh, prone to dislodge. And depending on how you size them, how the uh, tissue characteristics are, or even in the future, if there is an infection which could increase the device uh, tissue characteristics, and devices can dislodge. And uh, they don't conform. It's almost like uh, putting, as I say, a square keg in a round hole. Uh, where do we use these devices? There are numerous applications. You're looking at vascular applications, cardiac applications. I'll briefly, we'll go through some of them. Vascular, you're looking at various shunts, aneurysmal cavities, which our neurosurgical colleagues, most of them close in the cerebral, for cerebral aneurysms. There's also a lot of bleeders, even a retroperitoneal bleed that can be uh, closed with some of these uh, vascular plugs. When you come to the cardiac, uh, there is, uh, the use is even more uh, broad. You're looking at shunts, uh, more ASDs, VSDs, PFOs, and also you're looking at uh, paravalvular leaks, both aortic and uh, uh, mitral. Our, Aneurysmal cavities, this includes left ventricular atrial or even aortic uh, aneurysmal cavities. Left atrial appendage occlusions, as we talked about this today, and also perforations, which can be acute, including uh, post MI uh, perforations. So, in the vascular world, including shunts, there is arterial, arterial, arterial venous, as well as veno venous shunts that can be uh, closed. We talked about cerebral aneurysms. I just put in a couple of examples here, which are a lot more complex in the sense. Uh, on the top uh, picture, you see a, a major aortopulmonary capillary artery uh, occlusion. Here, we're using uh, coils and ABP2 devices to close a major shunt that's occurring due to a map cut. And in the below picture, you see a pulmonary AVM closure. So there's a huge aneurysmal uh, pulmonary AVM, as you can see in the picture on the left, which is actually closed by, again, uh, I think it was an ABP2 device as well. So when you come to cardiac, the, the users go further. So you're looking at shunts, which is the atrial uh, or ventricular shunts. On the top left of the figure, you see a VSD being closed with a ADO device. And um, again, you know, uh, it can be even more complex. On the right picture, you see a Restella procedure, which is adult congenital heart procedure, wherein uh, you have a conduit from the right to the uh, PA. And there was a shunt crossing across from the, uh, both from the atria that needed to be closed, which was causing a lot of shunts. So as you can see, two devices put, put in, clearly they don't conform to the uh, anatomy of this uh, structures there. But they work, and uh, it is still a, uh, not a complete uh, closure. And uh, on the bottom picture here, uh, maybe I can play this again. Here you see a really complex uh, PBL which has a connection through a pseudoaneurysm into the LV. So here we used a septal and uh, transaortic uh, rail, sorry, transapical rail, and then we used a, a large AST device to close the LV aneurysm as well as the PBL uh, through the aneurysm. So we're just being innovative, but clearly these devices are not designed for this kind of uh, structural abnormalities. And of course, the left radial appendage is seen in the lower picture. So what are the types of device occluders that we have right now? So amplastic type of devices, which are vascular plugs. You see on the right corner, the most of the in uh, profile, uh, right from AVP1 to AVP2, 3, 4, and uh, you see a ductal occluder, ASD, VSD, as well as the new Oclotec device, which has been uh, approved for PBL closures. But again, they're not, you're adapting these devices for uh, something which is not meant to be. Uh, apart from this, from, from the panels may use, this is uh, geontorco coils that people use for closure of aneurysmal cavities, especially uh, uh, neurosurgical colleagues. And there were some uh, prior uh, devices that we've been, I think they are extinct now. Uh, the first time I heard of a detachable balloon uh, on a vascular uh, structure, I was like, this is cool. I said, this has been done and tested. Uh, and we have core uh, helix types of devices, and also there is something called a sideri type of devices, you see in this particular uh, here. It's actually a polyurethane patch, which is placed on a double balloon, uh, 
and has a detachable sleeve, so you actually leave the balloon there for a closure of ASD or VSD, and the patch sort of uh, takes uh, or conforms to the device that the balloon is retrieved uh, later. So these devices, I think most of them are extinct, but you can see that none of them are designed for uh, the structural abnormalities that we face every day. So what should a, uh, uh, what should a uh, cardiac occluded device have? What should the characteristics be? First of all, it should provide a permanent hermetic seal to whichever uh, closure you're trying to do. It should occupy minimal necessary space. This again, uh, does, uh, one not to cause injury to the adjacent structures, and also you, don't, you want to be minimalistic. It should be biocompatible and allow tissue integration, but not cause overgrowth. And again, overgrowth, as you can see, can cause more problems. And for deploying them, uh, it should be visible on a fluoroscopy or even any other imaging diagnostics that you do. So it should be compatible with them and visible in them. And it should configure to the defect, and it's not the other way around. As you can see in the PBL world, at least, uh, we were using ADO devices in the past, which are a lot more uh, uh, stronger, or uh, let me put it uh, that way. So once the AVP2 devices are less uh, radial strength, so to speak. And they should have the ability to resist migration and anabolization. They should probably even an anchoring system, I'm not sure, but uh, some sort of mechanism which resists migration and embolization. They should be retrievable, adjustable, and repositionable. Again, there's a lot of ask, but I think these are the future we are looking at. And it should be easy and consistent. It should be easy to deploy, and it should uh, be consistent every time you deploy them. And you should have accurate deliverability and compatibility as well. And at this structure, we're also talking about not only the device uh, design, but also about the delivery systems itself, because <coughs> delivery systems matter too in terms of delivering these devices. So I think uh, they have to be talk talkable, kink resistance, various other things that you're able to get the delivery systems. And it should be compatible with other structures and other implanted devices. We talked about this as well. An ability to resist corrosion. Most of the nitinol devices are uh, corrosion resistant, but maybe in the future we don't even have to talk about nitinol devices. Maybe you're talking about even biocompatible devices. And uh, ability to resist hemolysis and clot formation. This is more relevant in the uh, PVL world. And ability to maintain structure and functional integrity for the expected lifetime passive device. So how does the future entail? I, I foresee this happening. 3D printing is right now a reality. And uh, uh, I think we're looking at a time where we are able to use imaging to sort of look at a defect and say, how do I tailor a device to this? And I think it's very close. And you can also do it uh, virtual and in imaging. Uh, now we've got fantastic imaging, and you can actually place a virtual uh, device. You can get the device STLs onto a device and then place them in uh, a 3D imaging structure and see if it fits. And that way, you can actually tailor some of these devices. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. I think hopefully we'll have some time at the end. Of course. That's a very nice presentation. So my co-chair, Dr. Yadav, will speak on Watchmen, what the future needs. Right, so thank you for the invitation and thank you for coming here. Uh, these are my disclosures. So when you think about what do we need in future, it depends on what the challenges are today. And our first speaker in this session, Dr. Saw, highlighted some of these challenges and which surround around device procedure, which surround around the device, maybe the procedure, some of the data, um, deficits that we have and how do we increase the awareness. So major complications of this LA closure, specifically Watchmen, have reduced as we learned this process through several studies, but it's still to a point where when you're offering this therapy as a prophylactic therapy, then really we want it to go further down. And pericardial tamponade, even though it's less common, it's still around 1%. A variety of factors that, that go into why somebody has a pericardial tamponade. Uh, you see either early tamponade or late. Early is usually related to the transeptal puncture or manipulation of device in the LAA. Or you see delayed tamponade, which sometimes is due to microperforations, commonly in the setting of 
initiation of a NOAC or low molecular weight heparin, pulmonary artery bleeding, and sometimes patient factors get into the play. Some of the challenging LA anatomy, shallow depth, when you're trying to get a bigger device with a limited depth, uh, and then certainly the device features, open cell versus closed end, or length and number of anchors, all of these play. The current Watchman device, as you all know, is more of a spherical or a square. If you want to use a 27 device, you need ample depth. So in, not all appendages have adequate depth, so you're trying to always push the device in, cheat the feet maybe, trying to accommodate that reasonable compression that you want for that device. So, and that's one of the challenges with this particular generation. Hopefully, we'll get little less of an issue with the next generation Watchman Flex, which not only has a closed cell, but you also don't need as much depth. And the deployment will be a little bit different as compared to the current generation. Obviously, safe procedural techniques, safe transeptal will still remain the key no matter how good the device is. And then imaging right now, the standard of care is transesophageal, for, except a few handful of centers, most, most of us are doing this as a general anesthesia with TEE, but TEE is, has some implications. It needs GA, it needs an anesthesiologist, needs an echo doctor, uh, comfort of the patient, and safety in elderly patients with COPD. It also adds to a scheduling issue for your program coordinators, you know, you, you have to get the anesthesia echo. So it would be really nice in future if you can get away from the general anesthesia and TEE and still be able to deliver safe uh, and effective procedure. Intracardiac echo can, may, or, or at least has some potentials. It doesn't need general anesthesia. It's comfortable to the patient or less uh, discomfort, less personnel involved, but obviously there are challenges. The technology is not exactly where we all want. There are limited views. The, there are uh, tissue dropouts issues, the explain issues, live 3D, suboptimal images if you leave the transducer in the right atrium. You could navigate that transducer in the left atrium, but that also adds a layer of uh, complex complexity. Does require an additional venous access, which can cause complications and obviously has a learning curve. But it does have some potential and there are scant reports of its feasibility. This is from Dr. Reddy's group where 27 watchments were implanted and uh, with really no major complications in, in this subset. There is some uh, sizing discrepancy between ICE and TEE that should be put into context, but not enough to change the device size. This is another study uh, which was uh, using Amulet. It's a retrospective single study, about 100 devices. Uh, on TEE arm versus ICE arm, and you can see there was no difference in major complications. Yes, these are selective experience single centers, but if the technology is good and we focus on teaching and learning, maybe it has potential. And maybe with these ICE cases, we combine this CT scan pre-procedure planning, get more of sizing. CT has various advantages in itself, we are seeing increase in the CT pre-procedure planning for commercial watchmen. The patient doesn't need to be NPO, so less likely their LA pressure will be lower. It's complementary to echo, and it maybe it gives you a little better evaluation of these complex uh, appendages. So, data. There are there is very good data. This is the five-year uh, analysis from from our Protect AFN prevailed trials that shows definitely significantly lower hemorrhagic stroke with the watchman compared to warfarin and uh, consistently reduced cardiovascular mortality, all-cause death, and very significant reduction in major bleeding. But if you look at this pharmacotherapy in this commercial indication, post-implant, warfarin is given for 45 days and then a patient gets a TEE and then you decide if uh, there is no thrombus, no major leak around the device, then you discontinue the warfarin and continue high-dose aspirin and clopidogrel up to six months. But the issue is that it does require 45 days of warfarin, and so what about patients who aren't candidates for oral anticoagulation, even for short duration? I think that's a data void right now. 
and which is, uh, if you look at, at the Pinnacle Registry, half of the patients are not on anticoagulation. So there is a big subset of these AFib patients who are not on anticoagulation. How can we offer them this commercial watchman? ASAP2 is a clinical trial uh, which is trying to investigate this further. Patients who are not a candidate for oral anticoagulation are two to one randomized to either watchman or medical therapy. If they're into watchman, they get aspirin and clopidogrel up to three months. And this is important because this, this, this graph just shows you that really the bleeding difference between watchman and warfarin starts separating after six months once you know the oral anticoagulation and clopidogrel is discontinued. So if we can in future, if, depending what the ASAP2 trial shows, if we can offer this watchman without having a need to give oral anticoagulation and maybe a shorter DAPT, we may have more benefit with this therapy. Device-related thrombus, if it depends what registry you look at, but somewhere around 3.7 to 4%. It's not very common, but when it happens, it does increase heart rate for everybody. You, you do have to anticoagulate these patients, and yes, uh, this doesn't cause stroke in all patients, but definitely has a causative effect that these can cause strokes. So you wanna anticoagulate these patients, but these are already the patients who are not long-term candidates, so it makes the life a little bit difficult. And timing of DRT, it doesn't always happen within those first few weeks, so it's, that's also a little bit of challenge, like how long do you continue this? You can see these yellow dots, they're spread for several months. This is detection of DRT. And, and what that tells you is that even if you give six months of anticoagulation or DAPT, DRT might still stay. So we need something else to prevent this DRT. And this is just totally hypo, uh, my hypothesis, like is it the same bare metal drug eluting type phenomena and can we just do a drug eluting watchman to resist that early thrombotic concept until it fully endothelializes? And I do not know how far uh, the sponsors are or whether this is a reasonable or not reasonable idea, but certainly something to think about. The release pin is, maybe, is slightly more thrombogenic than the fabric. Maybe you reduce the surface area and uh, the next generation Watchman Flex does have this addressed partially. And then if you really want to look at the next generation Watchman, maybe include the biosensors, uh, measure the LA pressure that could help you with the heart failure therapies or give AFib burden, just in concepts. NOAX in non-valvular atrial fibrillation, really very strong data, multiple trials, really is, is the standard of care over warfarin and uh, very effective in decreasing the stroke and uh, you know, effective in bleeding as well. How do we compare NOAC versus Watchmen? It, it will be a tough trial to do, but ultimately I think we may need to do this to convince our, our general cardiologist that Watchmen could be offered as an alternate to NOAX. PROG-17 is an active trial going on on that topic, but 400 patients may not be an enough sample size to address every single answer we want. And then the question is, what about these combination things where uh, Watchtower is currently recruiting patients, but how do you, can you combine these with other therapies, mitroclips, can you combine with if atrial fibrillation ablation uh, procedures at the same time to uh, make it more uh, convenient to the patient. Obviously, reimbursement will be an issue in future if you're obviously doing two procedures at one time. Awareness and shared decision making. Awareness needs to be a little more, not just for the physician providers, uh, medical professionals, but even patients. They may not be aware of this therapy is available. It's not uncommon to see patients in clinic who are having second, third, fourth, fifth bleeding episode but have not heard Watchman is available. When CMS approved, really they emphasized on shared decision making involving patients, uh, uh, cardiologists and uh, non-implanting physicians and also involving the patients in, in, in this uh, procedural implant. So really we need a multi-pronged attack, some improvement in devices, learning the procedure, making it a little less invasive for the patient, data and guidelines, um, thrombus resistant, devices, a traumatic tip, and uh, really, if we can get away with no oral anticoagulation post-implant and just get patients involved 
with shared decision making. I do think that patients need to be aware of this at the time of AFib diagnosis. You may not offer them. Still tell them that there is, uh, you have this new diagnosis, there are no acts that we're giving you, but if you do run into problem down the line, there is something else that could be considered. It, unless we offer it that way, I don't think it's a completely shared decision making or informed consent. Right, thank you. Very nice. Next, what's uh, missing in occluder therapy? Uh, Dr. Heinger, did I pronounce that correctly? You did, correct. Good, thank you. All right. All right, folks, uh, thanks for hanging out, and I'd like to thank the hosts of the CBI, obviously the director, course directors. So this talk was what's missing in occluder therapy. So this is quite a big topic. So I didn't look at this from a perspective of really what's latest and greatest or what hole do we need to plug up with a new device, but rather what's missing in what I'm thinking of currently approved devices or devices that are utilized in the adult spaces, which what I treat. So I'd like to go into a little bit of description about what I would feel is really what we need to have in the future for the devices that we currently use. And some of the prior speakers actually hit on some of those points. So this is my disclosures. So occlusion therapy. So we know there's a number of devices that are currently utilized in the PFO ASD space, especially in Europe. So left atrial appendage space has emerged as a source of occlusion therapy over the last 10 years. And as we have, the prior speakers have already said, especially the watchman has been thoroughly investigated. So we expect further advancements in this technology soon, but again, could it be better? For the watchman, what's the pros? So it's currently approved in the US. Pros, excellent track record of procedural success. What's missing in this space? So the risk of distal perforation with the legs and an incomplete seal, and I'm gonna also add in on this with the, of course, advent of the thrombus formation on the face of the device. It's an important aspect. Even though it's a minutia of the patient population, it could definitely result in a higher risk of stroke. So I will throw that in as well, and I think that uh, prior a description of having a, some non-thrombogenic face of the device or even a drug eluding is a fantastic idea. So here we look, obviously, at the current device on the left, and now the Watchman Flex that's coming on the right. Now, the one downside of the design, initially in Europe, what they were having was issues with embolization. So the hooks that you see present in the mid-body of the device itself, what would be better? Let's not have any embolizations, because now that you're getting rid of the feet distally, I would rather not have a decrease in perforation to have an increase in embolization. So the goal of this flex, hopefully, will be taking care of both, because obviously, I feel in any skilled operator utilizing the, the current device, Perforation is less riskier, and we obviously try to plan on low embolization risk. That's why we like to do over compression with these devices. But hopefully, with the next generation device, we will see hopefully no perforations, and hopefully the embolization risk will be negligible with the hooks that are present there, and hopefully the device has been changed. What else do we need in these current devices? And you see on the left, there's the AMPLATS, according to the, the uh, AMLET trial that's ongoing currently. We need SEAL. So Watchman's approved, but what's the, one of the things that we notice at 45 days and six months? We're obviously looking for a seal zone. We wanna make sure there's less than a five millimeter leak around the device, because guess what? We can say, oh, there's a five millimeter leak, but what does that do for the patient? We gotta put them back on their NOAX or their blood thinning or their recumbent therapy. It doesn't give them a suitable answer. So again, seal zone is an issue. We always like to emphasize that when you're deploying these devices, potentially over compressing, so get yourself a larger seal zone. Also, I'd like to emphasize, remember, the appendage is not a static organ or a static appendage. It basically moves, especially in sinus rhythm. So the expansion of this device or the appendage can actually create a seal. So keep that in mind if you're deploying this device in AFib rather than in sinus rhythm. So an imperfect seal, the presence of an imperfect seal can mitigate the usefulness of the device. It's painful to tell a patient after six months that they will have to go back on blood thinning medication. And I've done it, and it's not something you pr I'm proud of, but you wanna do what's right for the patient. So case reports of placement of vascular plugs in cases of watchmen and coils, yes, you can do that, but do you really wanna put a vascular plug on top of a watchman sticking out into the left atrium? And coils, 
I'll give people credit that do this, but I'll be very honest. All it takes is one slip of that catheter and that coil is now embolizing somewhere you don't want it to go. So both additional procedures carry increased risks of embolization and dislodgement. So what's missing? Goals for future therapy. We want a reduction of distal perforation risk. We want better seal on the proximal portion of the device. We want risk of device-related thrombus. We really do want to work on this for industry's sake. We want to say, hey, is there a way we can make it less thrombogenic on the face of the device? And reduction of resource utilization. We talked about ice, but again, the downside with ice is the lack of the 135 degree view in the current standard that we utilize. And of course, delivering the catheter to the left atrial space. Do we really want two transeptal sticks or again, a larger hole across the septum with another venous stick? A lot of people are saying this is not worth the risk of actually using general anesthesia and TE. So something to work on. Let's move to PFO occluders. Devices that have been utilized for pediatric as well as adult space. So we've known for generations that this is, can be something that can be utilized successfully. Indications for adult population with cryptogenic stroke are rapidly evolving. So every day it seems like there's some more information saying that, you know what, 40 year old with a cryptogenic stroke with no other AFib issues, potentially this could be their therapy first line. So suspect utilization of these devices will only increase in the next few years. Current FDA approved devices, as you see here, are currently on the imaging here. Obviously, it's one of those situations where it's about user dependency or what you're comfortable utilizing in this space. But what's missing? Allergic components. Now, I don't have a lot of patients that have nickel allergies, but they exist. And it's something to keep in mind. And I think as interventionalists or as a proceduralist, we take this for granted oftentimes that we implant devices and then ask after the fact, by the way, were you allergic to that? Because we really don't ask this question that often beforehand. Anatomical variance, it's not one hole for one device. We have to understand that there's people with different types of sizes and obviously we'll need more variety in the devices we have. Again, device related thrombus, very critical that maybe these devices need to be designed so they aren't as thrombogenic. Erosion risks, and again, this is something when you put a device in a younger patient, now in the TAVR space, what's the biggest controversy we discussed today? You're putting these things in low risk patients eventually, what happens 10 years later? You gotta put another one in, or what are you gonna do with it? So just like this, when we're putting these type of devices in younger population, is there an erosion risk 10, 15, 20 years down the line? Presence of peristructural leaks, and the ability to place subsequent devices if there is a leak. And that's another thing, is because how many devices do we place across the septal space? Going on to ASD and VSD closures, current devices that are currently in use right now. Of course, obviously it's user dependent on what your comfort level is on utilizing these. But what's missing in this space? Again, the erosion issues related to the device and applicability to numerous sizes and fenestrations. Remember, how close is the VSD or ASD to the actual septal wall compared to there is a rim or no rim? Is there device related to thrombus formation and ease of use, especially in the VSD population? Now in the adult population, we often see VSDs post myocardial infarctions. Are these the best patients for us to be putting these devices in? And if we do, does the myocardium have enough stability? Is it ischemic or dead tissue? Will it actually seat this device properly without embolizing? So missing pieces in the left atrial space, peri-device leaks, thrombus formation, device-related perforation. The PFO space, the erosion, the leaks, the challenging anatomy and not requiring multiple devices. And when you go into the ASD, VSD space, again, the erosion, leaks, and ease of use. So my conclusions are the current technology is very good, but it could be better. Rapidly changing guidelines, indications for LA and PFO closure will drive the technology. So I suspect we're gonna start putting these devices in younger patients and patients who may not have all the contraindications that they have currently with the guidelines. So long-term safety is critical to the utilization of these devices. Thank you so much. That's a very nice summary. One other point is that uh, it's also important for the device to allow like future access to them because there are so many interventions happening these days in the left atrium, mm -hmm. interatrial septal access is uh, critical. And you can only imagine when we put a PFO or ASD closure in a 30 year old, when it gets to 60 or 70 or 80, what kind of left atrial therapies will we have at that time? And do we have a device that favors little more over the other in terms of preserving that access. And I agree that the size of like a mitral clip 24 French sheath is not favorable to place across a PFO closure. So I think you're right. We have to keep that in mind that down the line, these catheters are large and what are we creating? Right, and next speaker is uh, Dr. Scott Lilly. He's gonna talk about endoatrial shunt therapy.
All right, uh, thank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to admit uh, right away that I feel a little bit out of place. We've heard about, you know, plugging paravogular leaks. We've heard about closing ASDs. We've heard about uh, VSDs and left atrial appendages. We're going to talk about putting a hole inside the heart now, something that seems very contrary to, to the theme of the, uh, of the session, but it's a lot of fun to talk about, and, uh, and I hopefully uh, I can share some things with you that you haven't heard before. All right, so uh, we'll talk about interatrial shunt therapy, and, and I want to begin by saying this concept has been primarily tested in patients that have heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Uh, we know this is prevalent. About 40% of patients with heart failure have this. It's expected to exceed the prevalence of systolic heart failure very soon. But as prevalent as it might be, it's not always obvious, right? These patients have dyspnea. They go from their pulmonologist to their cardiologist. They obviously have a, a normal ejection fraction. They may have a normal brain nature erratic peptide, and they may even have normal resting hemodynamics when they finally make it to the cath lab. But the phenotypic feature that discerns them and explains their dyspnea is that with exercise, they have a disproportionate increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Wedge pressure of 15, top end of normal can become 35. Uh, so we have a way to diagnose these folks. We also know that exercise hemodynamics have prognostic value. They relate directly to exercise capacity. Elevations in intracardiac pressures precede uh, cardiovascular events. And exercise hemodynamics allow us to better prognosticate from a survival perspective patients with heart failure. But despite this growing awareness of now, hey, we can tell you why you're short of breath and you know what, this is important, these numbers are valid, we've not made really any progress in the therapies for heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. In fact, look at all of the, the red lines here on the right. These are conventional systolic heart failure therapies that just don't work in patients with a preserved ejection fraction. And so, might a mechanical solution to this problem have merit? If you look even more closely at the 2010 paper that Barry Borlaug out of the Mayo Clinic did where he really uh, established exercise hemodynamics as the way to, to diagnose this condition, you realize that pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in this population increases a considerably greater amount than right atrial pressure, disproportionate increase in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So might this be a rationale for an interatrial shunt? That is, allowing left atrial pressure to exhale fill the right atrium when it wants to increase, and thereby relieving pulmonary venous congestion and, and treating the dyspnea. Usually at this point, uh, there's murmurs in the audience or someone shoots up a hand and says something like, wait, I thought you guys were supposed to be closing these, or uh, are you simply trading one problem for another when you talk about putting a shunt in the atrial septum? Uh, those are valid comments, but, but I'll say this concept isn't entirely new. Uh, in the early 1900s, there was a case series of, of patients with something called Lutenbacher syndrome. Uh, these are patients that had a left-sided valvular condition, typically mitral stenosis, but had a coincident VSD. And those patients did much better than the physicians would have anticipated. Uh, one example was a woman that lived to 72 years old uh, and had 11 uncomplicated pregnancies, severe mitral stenosis and an ASD. Uh, the, the group from Chicago in 2001, they taught us that sometimes when you close an atrial septal defect in, in an elderly gentleman, you unmask the hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic footprint of diastolic heart failure, and it precedes clinical diastolic heart failure. So maybe the ASD is actually protective in some patients. And then perhaps a handful of us in this room have been consulted by our surgical colleagues saying, we have this patient, we cannot get them on, off ECMO, they have profound LV dysfunction. Will you please create a hole in their septum and allow the ventricle to exhale a little bit and hopefully wean them? If we could perhaps employ this strategy in, in a less uh, urgent way, in a more controlled fashion, perhaps we can disrupt the increase in left atrial pressure that precedes exertional dyspnea in patients with diastolic heart failure. And this is precisely uh, the strategy that these trials are employing. So uh, there are three devices that are available. If you look very hard uh, in this space, I'll talk mostly about the Corvia device. It has the most clinical evidence. Uh, reported for it. Uh, it's a, a 16 French catheter. You get left or, or right femoral venous access. You perform a transseptal puncture in an anticoagulated patient right through the center of the fossa ovalis. Uh, you expose the left atrial legs, retract the device. You make sure the proximal end is in the right atrium. Then you expose the right, uh, the right uh, sided legs. What you're left with at the end of all that is an eight millimeter diameter atrial septal defect. Uh, it's been evaluated in a handful of studies. I'll, I'll skip right to the CE Mark study. This was a single arm trial, which means every patient in the trial got the device. It was 64 patients, and the phenotype is one you recognize. Uh, 
uh, more females than males. Uh, there's uh, obesity is prevalent and they're hypertensive, okay? Uh, these patients had a mean ejection fraction of around 50 and resting wedge pressure was only 17, but with exercise it went to 35. Uh, the 12-month uh, results from this uh, single-arm trial have been reported. Uh, in short, there were improvements in exercise time, exercise distance, improvements in NYHA class, and improvements in exercise pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Importantly, up to 12 months, these shunts remained patent with a QPQS between 1.25 and 1.3. That trial gave way to the first randomized trial in the space. It was called Reduced Lap HF1. 44 patients, pretty small. 22 got the device, 22 had a sham procedure. Uh, the 30-day uh, uh, primary endpoint was reported uh, about a year and a half ago, and what you see on the right side of the screen here, patients that received the uh, interatrial shunt device actually had lower pulmonary capillary wedge pressure upon exercise, where the panel on the left control patients exhibited no such hemodynamic outcome. This was the primary endpoint of that trial, uh, but the 12-month results have uh, been completed. They're going to be presented in their totality next month at ESC. Uh, I will share with you that in the group that received the device, there was more than a 50% reduction in heart failure events. So if you look at the aggregate uh, clinical data uh, with, with this device, it's safe. One year survival is high, freedom from stroke is high, and although it is technically feasible to close these with an ASD closure device, it's not been necessary. There's been no thrombosis and there's been no necessity for a surgical implant, so rather good safety. From an efficacy perspective, if you look at the aggregate of the experience, NYHA class improves, uh, surrogates of quality of life improve, uh, heart failure hospitalizations have been reduced, and the shunt remains patent at 12 months. So this is the reduced LAP HF2 trial. It's currently enrolling. The goal is for more than 600 patients. Uh, the primary outcome is at 12 months now, not 30 days, and it includes things like cardiovascular mortality, heart failure hospitalizations, uh, and, uh, and quality of life scores. I want to spend uh, the last minute and a half here or so to introduce you to a second device that should be entering clinical trials in the U.S. this year. That's the goal. It's called the V-Wave device. Uh, from your chair, you can look at the screen and say, hey, that's larger profile. You're right. It's a larger profile device. It's hourglass glass shaped, uh, and it uh, leaves you not with an 8 millimeter ASD, but with a 5.1 millimeter ASD. I'll share with you that iteration number one of this device contained a valve that only permitted flow from left atrium to right atrium. The theory was, well, let's reduce or eliminate the risk of paradoxical embolism. Uh, the initial experience was done primarily in, uh, in Canada. Uh, Dr. Rose Cabot implanted 10 patients. These were sicker patients than were in the other trials I was telling you about, but implant success was high, and the early hemodynamic uh, result is exactly what you would expect. Uh, there was improved pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and an improved ability to, uh, to, to walk. When they uh, expanded this to include more patients and longer follow-up, though, there, there was an unexpected finding. At 12 months, they observed that flow across the shunt was absent or diminished in 50% of the patients. Uh, this was eventually uh, referred to panis ingrowth into the device. So iteration one of the device was scrapped. Iteration two now does not contain the valve that allows unilateral flow. So bidirectional flow is possible through the device. Uh, and they have 12-month large animal data that establishes the patency of the device. Uh, if you simply looked at the patients that had a patent device at 12 months within the early V-Wave experience, the results are what you would expect. Favorable hemodynamic result, favorable quality of life, and NYHA class improvement. So uh, we will await the larger trial here, uh, again, expected to commence later this year. Uh, so uh, to conclude, uh, you, can, you can read the first two bullets. This is one of those spaces where um, long-term follow-up is going to be absolutely critical because if, as you're thinking through what the complications of this class of devices might be, you probably acknowledge that they will be rare events in any, in, in any scenario, right? So long-term follow-up and, and being sure that we don't have things like paradoxical embolism or progressive right-sided heart failure will be critical. Right, thank you. Makes a lot of sense. We're going to be site for this V-Wave uh, clinical trial. It's an interesting trial design, and the control arm is a sham control. So everybody gets a venous access and kind of yeah. spend some time and maybe do a right heart cat. And yeah, we were doing a, I, th I think that's yeah. genius. So uh, the, the fellows were able to come in and do a full cardiac ice exam on the sedated patients right. for reduce. And, and, uh, and you have to waste the, 30 minutes to. Not uh, just the patient's blinded, but they're evaluating cardiologist who's the non-implanter is also blinded. Correct. Uh, 
Good, we're up to Dr. Huber, whose left atrial appendage will I close? So, can, can you get escape that up? Escape, maybe? Hmm? Try escape. Upper, upper left. Escape. Uh, there you there go. go. All right, well, I want to thank, uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, what I'm going to uh, do today is not go through a laundry list of all the potential candidates uh, for uh, left atrial appendage occlusion, uh, but rather uh, share with you some special considerations, perhaps, that you've not thought about. Um, and I'm going to look at it from four different perspectives. So we're going to talk mostly about a clinical perspective. Uh, but I'm going to switch gears then and talk a little bit about uh, looking at who to close from an anatomical and physiologic perspective, and then maybe even touch on some regulatory issues and some hospital administrative issues. So from a clinical perspective, uh, far and away, the number one consideration, in my opinion, should be those people that are unprotected. Uh, and that's a lot of people. This is uh, warfarin data, Medicare claims data showing, everybody knows this, that about 40, 50 percent of patients uh, are untreated, and in fact, the people that are at the highest risk, like a CHADS VAS score of six or older patients, are the least likely to be protected. And uh, with the initiation of the DOAX, things have gotten a little bit better um, because they're easier, people don't have to take warfarin, all the hassles of warfarin, but in a, it, essentially, there's been about a 5% improvement in people covered in the NOAC era, and that's still unacceptable. This slide is from the Pinnacle Data Registry. You've already seen a little bit of this presented earlier. And this is very striking because, again, it shows that about 40% of patients in contemporary cardiology practices are not treated. Uh, and what's also striking about this is the variability depending on which site you are. Uh, it looks like site number one is doing a really good job, and site number 121, maybe not so much. And so this is, a, uh, this is kind of a graph that shows, based on your CHADS VAS score, what your risk of ischemic stroke would be, uh, untreated, okay? And this is the line um, of warfarin efficacy, right? And then what this does, and you've, again, you've seen this before, is this is uh, how all the trials, both the, the registries and the, and the trials and the uh, for the Watchman device map out. And I would submit, okay, that um, the red line is unacceptable. So if somebody is untreated, there are better options, okay? Now what we've done at, uh, at the Mid-America Heart Institute in Kansas City is we've come up uh, at, with this best practice advisory. This is in-house designed. And so when we have a patient in the clinic that has a chads vas score of greater than or equal to two, Okay, you can't get out of your EPIC record without this box coming up in front of you. And what this does is it helps facilitate and acknowledge, you know, what's going on. And it also sets up a process where you can, you know, order, um, refer to a structural clinic. Uh, you can actually say, oh, we missed that one, uh, open up the anticoagulation order set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is going to be uh, potentially something that is going to be very useful to identify patients that can benefit. So from clinical perspective, number two, of course, is bleeding, okay? And um, people that have already had bleeding events, that's pretty simple. What about people that are at a very high risk of bleeding? And the challenge with this is this, okay? So this is, there's actually 10 models, models that are out there to predict risk of bleeding with 30 different variables, okay? Um, and the one that everybody talks about is the has bled score, but I would submit that it's really, really hard, if not impossible, to really predict who is at high risk for something that might not happen. So I'm going to talk about a few special considerations in these high-risk patients that I want to bring to your attention. Number one, okay, is the elderly with cognitive dis um, impairment, okay? These are patients with, uh, that have a high likelihood of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. These are 75 or older year patients with dementia, and if you look at autopsy studies, it shows that a significant number of these patients have CAA. And of course, this data shows that most of the patients that you see with atrial fibrillation are over the age of 75. And so I would submit that it's very important that you have uh, a team-based approach with your neurologist uh, to, and, and dementia uh, neurologist to identify patients potentially are untreated because of this. The second issue 
that has, is, is, is really challenging for me personally is this whole notion of um, vasculopaths. Okay? People that are on dual antiplatelet therapy and they come in and um, do you treat them with triple therapy or what? Now, with the Pioneer data and all the other data, this is very, very confusing and difficult to sort out. But I would submit that, again, looking at the pinnacle registry, if you look at the people that in those 40% of patients that were not treated, the reason that they weren't treated is because they have unstable angina coronary artery disease, PAD, prior cabbage. And so I think these patients that um, we feel need antiplatelet therapy and dual antiplatelet therapy might be a special consideration. The last one from a high risk of bleeding perspective is just the opposite. I would submit that a lot of people are putting these devices in because of frailty, but if you actually look at the data, it takes over a thousand falls before the benefit risk ratio uh, switches over. So really I think that, that uh, frailty is okay, uh, a fall risk is okay, but um, that's probably something that we should um, really ask ourselves whether these people really genuinely have uh, contraindications to uh, anticoagulation. So uh, the lastly, the clinical perspective is what I would term pharmacotherapy challenges. Um, there's two types. There's adherence. Okay, we know that for the fact that people just don't take their medications, so again, if patients are unable to take their medications, they're unable to afford these medications. That's a cons uh, special consideration. And then the other one that I think is very interesting is adequacy, okay? Uh, because a lot of patients, I'm seeing a lot of patients that are under, relatively undertreated, okay? Because the scenario is, oh, they've had a bleeding event um, and they were on full dose, but you know, maybe let's try low dose anticoagulation. And so the question is, is that, does that work? Um, and in fact, if you look here in the Aristotle trial, 5% of patients actually met the criteria for low dose of Pixaban, but 25% of global prescriptions uh, are actually for 2.5 BID. And are so, so maybe that's better than nothing, but I don't think we have the data to necessarily support that. So let's move on to anatomic and physiologic considerations, okay? Now, there's a lot of good data out there that really is looking at, you know, the pathology and the pathophysiology of that correlation of atrial fibrillation and, and stroke. And we know that left atrial modeling, remodeling with increased left atrial volume, increased left atrial fibrosis, and decreased left atrial function are important predictors, independent of the CHADS VAS score. This is all the data that shows that LAA function and LAA morphology and orifice area and fibrosis actually matter. And so one of the factors that I factor in to see these patients in terms of choosing whether to close somebody or not is not just based on the CHADS VAS score and their clinical criteria. It actually is very helpful if they have an echocardiogram and you can see what their left atrial appendage looks like. Because if you look at this data here, okay, the biggest strokes occur in patients with low emptying velocities and large diameter. Um, uh, appendages. And so again, I think it's a special consideration and a factor to consider. And of course, the morphology, there's data to show that the chicken wings are less likely to have strokes than the other types. But again, I think we're going to learn more over time of getting even better at predicting who would benefit the most from these therapies. The last one from a physiologic perspective is this data, and I really struggle with this as well, uh, and, and it's scary data to me. Um, this is from the Aristotle trial showing that actually if you look at these different quartiles of biomarkers, and this particular one is nt pro BNP, you can see that somebody with a CHADS VAS score of 3 with the highest quart in the highest quartile of pro BNP um, is actually at a much greater risk of stroke than somebody with a CHADS VAS score greater than or equal to five with no biomarkers. Um, and we and I have yet to figure out exactly how to integrate this data in my decision making in terms of who to close or not to close. You know, obviously we have the ABC risk tracker, but, but again, we're, I'm not using that on a regular basis. I'm trying to figure that out. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, uh, you saw some of this also earlier. Um, we know that Medicare coverage matters because uh, we have to get paid for this device. And these are the three things that I think you need to consider, okay? So this is a flip side of it is these are people that I will not close unless these three things happen from a regulatory perspective because uh, I don't look good in orange, okay? Number one, um, eligible patients must have, must have a CHADS VAS score of greater than or equal to three, not two. Number two, they must be suitable for short-term warfarin but deemed unable to take long-term oral anticoagulation, but this decision should be made primarily by a, quote, independent non-invasive physician, 
okay? So again, documentation of the electronic medical record that somebody other than me, okay, has opined on this and has felt that this patient needs to be considered for, um, is not a good long-term anticoagulation candidate, is very important to document. And then there must be a documented uh, formal evidence for a formal shared decision interaction. And this is one that I use. I actually show this to patients um, and to educate them that uh, here's your appendage and uh, the throm you know, anticoagulation prevents the clot from forming in your source. And what the Watchman device does is it actually eliminates the source. So these visuals for patients from a shared clinical decision-making perspective, I think are really, really valuable. And then I use this three-door approach. So I talk about the risk of doing nothing is door number one, the risk of going on anticoagulation or restarting anticoagulation if they've had a bleeding event is door number two and door number three would be the watchman device, okay, or left atrial appendage closer. And so we talk about the risks of doing, uh, of, uh, of, to begin with, uh, and then we'll talk about the benefits and the risks of each one of those three therapies. And I think this is a nice tool for patients and their families to visualize and then they can pick. Okay, door number one, and most of the patients that are older that um, are in their 70s and 80s love this because they used to watch The Price is Right and they can choose door number one, door number two, or door number three. So lastly, um, I'll finish up with a hospital administrative slide. I only have one slide in this and it's all about the money. And I can tell you that in Kansas City, our market is one where we don't get paid uh, a lot for this device. And it's very regionally different, depends on if you're on the East Coast, the North Coast, um, this, the, the West Coast, North, South, East, and West. And I would submit that um, um, it's a consideration uh, that um, a lot of hospitals and administrators are looking at kind of the relative benefits of this because it, do, it is resource uh, intensive uh, and sometimes the reimbursements aren't what we all think that they are. And so, again, looking at it through a different lens. Uh, so in conclusion, I think clinical co considerations, number one, are unprotected patients and if you come up with a, a, a best practice advisory um, using your EMR the way it should be used to identify patients that might be very helpful. Prior bleeding history is kind of a low hanging fruit, but high risk of bleeding I would submit is very, very challenging. Um, but elderly with cognitive impairment I think you should pay special attention to um, the vascular pass and frailty. Um, the pharmacology issues, adherence and adequacy are very important. Um, I think beyond clinical characteristics, anatomic and physiologic considerations should be considered. The size, the shape, the function, biomarkers, uh, regulatory considerations, of course, are important. And um, as a physician, I don't really care about the administrative uh, uh, um, uh, considerations, but being the executive medical uh, director of the Heart Institute, I have to care a little bit about these kinds of things. And so um, make sure you uh, do your due diligence from that perspective. Thank you very much. Trust of time, we'll keep moving and we'll maybe discuss some questions at the end. So, next speaker is uh, Dr. Jonathan Schwartz, close to PFO. Thank you to the moderator, Dr. Yadav, and Dr. Carroll. It's an honor, especially because Dr. Carroll is one of my former mentors. So, uh, and congrats to Paul and the uh, organizing committee on an another successful meeting. So, uh, we'll get right into it here given the time constraint. I uh, have no disclosures. Uh, just looking at the talks that are coming up, uh, so the uh, PFO closure uh, story has kind of had some twists and some bends, and so we'll go through the data, and then Mario will talk about uh, the devices available to us, and then Dr. Carroll will go through the, uh, what's coming in the future. So just a little bit of background. PFO frequently persists into adulthood. About 20 to 30 percent of patients in autopsy studies and TE studies show that they do have PFOs, and most of these are asymptomatic. Uh, the cryptogenic stroke is the most important manifestation of this. About 40% of ischemic strokes in patients less than 55 years of age have been determined to be cryptogenic. And then in the PFO atrial septal aneurysm study, uh, about 37% of these patients had a PFO and 8% had a PFO and an atrial septal aneurysm. Uh, so why is this important? It is a pathway for left to right shunting. About 57% of patients have, with a PFO have shunting at rest and about, uh, increases to 92%. Uh, with any straining or coughing. Migraines, vascular headaches, decompression sickness, and air embolism, tipnea and orthodeoxys syndrome have all been uh, thought to be related to PFOs, although maybe not necessarily de definitive in each of those yet. But So what are our, what are our therapies currently? Uh, so medical therapy is an option. There's percutaneous closure, and then rarely done is surgical uh, closure, which is usually done uh, in uh, association with another open heart surgery. 
It has been a little bit controversial. Uh, what role does the PFOI exactly play in cerebral ischemia? We don't know for sure. At least initially we didn't. Uh, the first trials did uh, fail to show significant reduction in stroke risk with PFO closure. We'll go through these. Uh, there, there were a lot of problems with these trials. So number one, the closure trial was a randomized control trial. 900 patients with stroke and CVA at, at six months. This was using the Starflex device, which is no longer on the market now, uh, with six months of dual antiplatelet therapy versus uh, anticoagulation, aspirin, or both. There was two-year follow-up. The hazard ratio was 0.78, and it was not significant with a p-value of 0.37, as you can see here. The next one was the RESPECT trial, which Dr. Carroll can talk a lot about. That's a randomized trial with 980 patients with stroke or a TIA at nine months. Uh, this used the Amplatzer device with one month of dual antiplatelet therapy uh, versus warfarin or antiplatelet therapy. There was a total of four separate options for therapy arms in this trial. It was event-driven. Uh, uh, once they reached 25 events, uh, the trial was halted. Uh, the hazard ratio here was 0.49, and it wasn't quite statistically significant with a p-value of 0.8, as you can see here. And then the PCPFO trial was an also a randomized trial. 400 patients that had stroke or TIA or an extracranial uh, thrombosis somewhere. Also used the Amplatzer device with one to six months of antiplatelet therapy versus warfarin, aspirin, or both. Uh, the, at five years of follow-up, the hazard ratio here was 0.63 and the p-value was 0.34. So there were a lot of issues that were outlined very nicely by Dominic and John in a recent paper that I'd recommend that kind of goes through in detail each of these trials as well as the latest ones. But in particular, they were underpowered with a very low fr event frequency. Uh, longer follow-up was definitely needed. Uh, some more rigorous and sensitive testing of the events due to the low event rate would help uh, maybe choose your patients a little bit better. The actual role of the device in causing stroke after the procedure is done, and then in, for enrollment, uh, looking specifically at patients that have had embolic strokes and maybe not including TIA and having some kind of verification of these events. Uh, there was a lot of non-standardization of the medical therapy arms, as you uh, saw there. Anatomy does play a large role in the, in the future risk, particularly with patients that have atrial septal aneurysm, and then a collaboration with neurology is critical. That really wasn't done in the initial trials. So, after a lot of initial excitement, uh, you know, we kind of saw the data, and it was like, oh, I don't really know what's going on. But then, in, on September 14th, 2017, this is a great uh, edition of any jam. If you're interested in PFO closure, it was kind of a reawakening, and we got some data that was a little bit more exciting. So. Uh, so the long-term follow-up for the RESPECT trial with a median follow-up of 5.9 years, again, all the same, 980 patients with stroke within nine months or TIA. Again, the Amplatzer device with the same four treatment options. Uh, for treatment exposure, there was 31, 41 patient years for PFO versus 26, 69. For the medical therapy, there was a lot of dropout for patients that did end up crossing over. Hazard ratio here was 0.55 with a p-value of 0.46, which was great. The closed trial was also presented in this article. Uh, which was a randomized controlled trial of 663 patients, stroke within six months. These patients specifically had a PFO with an atrial septal aneurysm or evidence of a large shunt on echo, which is important for later. Kind of interesting on this one, they were allowed to use any device they wanted uh, with three months of dual antiplatelet therapy and then single antiplatelet therapy after that versus single antiplatelet therapy versus a target-specific oral anticoagulant. There's a mean of 5.3 years for follow-up here. The hazard ratio was 0.03 with a p-value of less than 0.01. Uh, it was a little bit underpowered. Uh, that was one of the criticisms. But as you can see, a very significant result here. And then the reduced trial, a uh, randomized trial of 664 patients with a stroke within six months. This used the Helix device uh, with six months of dual antiplatelet therapy uh, versus aspirin dual antiplatelet therapy or single antiplatelet therapy after that. The follow-up was about 3.2 years with a hazard ratio of 2.3 and a p-value of 0.02. One thing to note here, there was a high rate of atrial fibrillation noted after closure, uh, and about 59% of the uh, evidence of cases of this resolved within two weeks. There was one stroke in a patient that had a fib post PFO closure, so important to make sure these patients are monitored after the device is implanted. But again, as you can see, significant results there. And then, not in this, uh, uh, in that NEJM journal, but a little bit later, the defense PFO trial came out, with, which was a randomized trial with 120 patients that had a stroke within six months, and also, again, a high-risk PFO that was determined by either having an atrial septal aneurysm, hypermobility of the septum more than 10 millimeters, or the PFO itself was greater than 2 millimeters. They used the Amplatzer device in this trial with six months of dual antiplatelet therapy or target-specific anticoagulant or uh, just any antiplatelet therapy after that. It was two-year uh, follow-up uh, uh, with a 12.9% event rate. Uh, 
and uh, the, the conclusions here was that the closure of the PFO was um, superior to medical therapy alone if it had these high-risk features. And again, you can see a significant result there. So then looking at the guidelines, uh, the chest physicians guidelines, the AHA and Stroke Association, as well as the neurology guidelines are all outdated. These were published before 2017. So numbers four and five here, you can see uh, the, so they don't support PFO closure uh, in patients that have a TIA or a PFO without, without evidence of a DVT or uh, on basically a class 2B uh, recommendation after that. The Canadian best stroke practice recommendations have been updated, uh, and those uh, do give kind of a soft recommendation for PFO closure. And then we're expecting uh, American guidelines to be updated soon. Although on Thursday, this was kind of interesting, the British Medical Journal just published a clinical practice guideline update uh, that uh, the editorials gave, had some kind of weird wording. They said it's slightly recommended to close uh, PFO and use antiplatelet therapy in patients under 60 with a cryptogenic stroke and a PFO. Uh, so they have a nice uh, little layout here of uh, their conclusions. And so for patients in which uh, anticoagulants are contraindicated, they do recommend, it's a strong recommendation for PFO closure. Uh, if any, if, if device closure is possible or if anticoagulants are also available, they have a weak uh, suggestion for PFO closure. And if there's a reason, if for some reason there's a contraindication to closure, then uh, there's a weak recommendation for anticoagulation. Uh, again, back in that same paper by Dominic and John, there's a nice uh, proposed algorithm really emphasizing that uh, involving your neurologist and kind of taking a team approach that we've learned from our uh, valve and devices, you can really get some good results and including the patient, obviously, in the decision is important as well. So in conclusion, uh, percutaneous PFO closure is more effective than antiplatelet therapy alone to reduce recurrent strokes in specific patient populations, specifically patients that are less than 60 that have an embolic appearing stroke and have a PFO present. PFO closure is uh, safe and there's a low complication rate. Uh, guidelines are likely to change soon and further studies are underway. Thank you. Thank you. A quick question for Dr. Carroll. You know, all these three devices used a somewhat different post-implant drug regimen. Uh, what's your practice and what do you recommend? Uh, it's typically several at least several months of dual antiplatelet therapy, then transitioning to aspirin alone, and and then after six months, an issue is, uh, do you need to continue aspirin in all these patients to cover other potential etiologies of stroke down the line, or if a particular patient's very young, is absent of any vascular risk factors, could you, in fact, even stop aspirin? That's, mm -hmm. that's where we're at at this point. Great, thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Gossel, Richard Ludo for PFOs. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I knew I, I just needed one slide or two after Jonathan because it, you know, it was impossible to do these two talks after each other without repeating things. So I'm going to skip through the slides that you just presented. And at the end of the day, you have to love statistics and you have to have a lot of patience and then you have to go one side or the other to close PFOs, right? Because I think. As you just pointed out, there's still criticisms. But what uh, occluder device to use? I think I picked the two that are really studied the most and that are really available to us in the United States. Um, you have a lot of strokes. And this whole discussion about um, closing the PVO is very simple. The patient is in front of you, has a cryptogenic stroke, and is afraid of having a new one. So that's the discussion that you have to have. And whatever other people tell you, now at least we have some data to support uh, closing the PFO. Um, and these are the two devices. So again, like uh, Jonathan pointed out, 2017, big trials reported. Both or all three trials really showed uh, that there is a significance. Again, I think that's just for statistics because obviously there's not a lot of um, um, events in all of these trials. I think I just want to point out a couple of things. These are usually the, the red markers here. First of all, for example, here in the uh, CLOSE uh, investigator trial, Germany and France, a lot of um, amplets or PFO occluders uh, were used. So again, this is available to us, the others are really not. And that's important because um, it is the mostly used uh, device in this uh, investigation. But it's also important to point out, like Jonathan just said, um, there seems to be a signal for 
uh, septal aneurysms and large shunts. So I mean, makes sense, right? So that's what we're gonna, uh, we're trying to solve that issue. If it's really a small shunt, how likely is it that someone had a stroke from that? So that's one focus, again, super small numbers, but again, statistically significant. One signal that I wanna point out, I think Jonathan mentioned that there is a little bit more atrial fibrillation in the PFO closure group. So I think you don't wanna create a problem by solving one problem, right? So you probably have to watch these guys a little bit because if you close to the, the PFO and all of a sudden they have atrial fibrillation, even if it's just briefly after the implantation, but there is a signal, so, so be aware of it. Uh, the other trial that uh, um, Jonathan pointed out or mentioned here, Again, this is dedicated um, Amplatzer PFO uh, occlusion device. Same results. Freedom from uh, stroke was uh, better in the device group. And again, a substantial better effect for the uh, larger septal aneurysm and the shunt. So I think that's important if you uh, are in a PFO closure program. Um, it appears that obviously when you're young and you have a cryptogenic stroke that you benefit throughout your life from it, so that's an important point that they made. And again, they pointed really out that the uh, large shunt and septal aneurysm is a, is a very important anatomical feature. Um, I think that in the beginning when we were all trained in this, uh, there are some operators that were always feel fearful of the amplitude device of erosions, and so there was a little uh, hesitancy in some operators, but I think this uh, trial also showed that we really didn't have that problem. So I think you have both devices available to you. Atrial fibrillation was again there also seen, but not necessarily significant. This DVT uh, signal that was seen there doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. I, I'm, I bet it was some closure of the femoral groin. I, I just can't see that that's really an issue for the, of the devices. Then of course the reduce. Like Jonathan pointed out, this is the uh, softer version of um, PFO closure. The cardioform device also, you know, very nice um, device. I like it personally. Uh, the most, but again, that's just personal preference. Again, same outcomes, low um, um, uh, events, but uh, statistically at least significant, uh, justifying it now. They also analyzed um, new brain infarcts by imaging, also a reduction uh, with closure. They also saw atrial fibrillation flutter, again, usually just in a few weeks after the deployment, but again, you don't want to create a problem by solving one. And um, when you look at the reduce uh, folks, then they, they put this, of course, together to, to compare both devices. And again, you can look at one or the other side and decide what device you really like best. But I look at this and I say both devices are really uh, good options. And it will de eventually uh, depend on um, your administration, really what device they're gonna maybe offer you. I think, Jonathan, I, I uh, congratulate they show this slide because it's really important. I think if you do PFO closure, don't just close uh, people that have a PFO. I think it is a, it's a teamwork. You have to have shared decision making, but you should involve your neurologist. Do teamwork because then the decision making is much easier. If you close PFOs, you have complications and then your neurologist and your institution wonders why you did it. I think that's just not good practice. So this is a really important slide and you can see it everywhere. So just as a take home point, I think both the um, a cardioform device now from Gore and the Amplitzer PFO closure device are really good devices. They all showed uh, good results. Again, you can argue about the statistics, but they're both um, um, effective. They seem to be uh, showing the best benefit in large a um, septal aneurysms and large shunts, and the cardioform device now is also safe in, in uh, septal aneurysms, so you can really uh, choose both. I would say you have to be a little careful with atrial fibrillation. So at least watch for it and make sure that you do some sort of screening. Um, and I also suggest that you build a comprehensive PFO program where you have team, uh, teamwork, as a neurologist, maybe even a hematologist, just to make sure that you're really treating the right patients. Thank you. Thanks a lot. We're running over time, so we'll just directly move to Dr. Carroll's talk. Dr. Carroll has really spearheaded this PFO field. Thank you. So a lot of really very good uh, discussions here. Uh, my disclosures. 
So where are these two fields going? Uh, uh, a lot of clinical challenges and hurdles have been overcome. And finally, at least in the United States, we have approved devices. Uh, but there are two treatments that are uh, mainstream, but they've had niche indications. So in the short term, the main activities in this field are kind of outlined here. We're really talking about broad implementation into clinical practice, the guideline uh, updates, uh, new device developments are ongoing, and we need more evidence to answer some of the remaining uh, questions, of which there are quite a few, and expand indications. And as Dark Schwartz mentioned, uh, uh, the Canadians really got off to a great start, and this is a good uh, summary incorporating the latest uh, randomized clinical uh, data. So it, it does give you some guideline guidance that I think will be uh, replicated in some of the subsequent documents coming out. Uh, this is one that hopefully will be coming soon from Sky, uh, along with the American Academy of Neurology. And it, it's much more about implementation of programs, uh, even though it's, it, there are really many programs already. Uh, it gives some guidance about quality monitoring uh, that I think are important, and uh, we'll expect that to come out soon. This is an outline of what's uh, included, uh, operator requirements, shared decision-making, multidisciplinary team, training, quality of care. So hopefully this will be uh, published in the next couple months. This may be out in the next month. This is a European document that uh, really is a pretty long document, really goes into uh, the evidence in, in a way that is uh, very interesting and has specific indications. And it tries to answer kind of two big questions of the role of closure versus medical therapy and then uh, oral anticoagulants versus antiplatelets in terms of what is uh, the optimal medical management. And Dr. Schwartz also pointed out this recent BMJ, and uh, there's the, the link. Uh, this is not a professional society related document. These are a variety of clinicians, and, and importantly, uh, I think there are three patients that were involved in development of this. Uh, one happened to be one of my patients. The visuals are great, um, uh, even though it's uh, somewhat perhaps oversimplified in terms of the kind of workup and decision making that goes on, it still does give a, a great framework and starts looking at different uh, questions, uh, as Jonathan said. And I think one of the important things, it does go into preferences and values. This is where the patients on the writing committee, I think, had a, a major play of sorting out how uh, patients and families work through uh, looking at the different uh, options. Uh, this is the original, well, it's actually the updated one that came out uh, kind of late uh, in, in terms of uh, not right before the three randomized trials that were positive came out. This is now being actively updated. How soon will it uh, be published? Probably late 2018. And it's very important to see the neurologists uh, move along with uh, incorporation of the latest randomized clinical trials because that's all about implementation of best practices to, to have that out there. Uh, where's the PFO field going? Um, probably within ischemic stroke, it's, it's really implementing what we know now and getting out there in practice and allowing clinicians and patients and families to work together to make these choices. But there is just a, to keep you up to date, uh, Bob Summer uh, is organizing a new national migraine trial. You know, we went through a very frustrating early phase of migraine PFO closure trials where there's a lot of trouble of enrollment, uh, a lot of uh, uh, how, what sort of endpoints are appropriate, and uh, they've come up with a very interesting um, way of pharmacologically assessing whether some a patient may respond to PFO closure or not by using a pharmacologic agent. So uh, fascinating, uh, interesting approach. Uh, the big thing, at least in my opinion, going on with uh, left atrial appendage closure, uh, particularly from the U.S. perspective, where we only have one device, is the need for more 
uh, devices because clearly we've seen with persistent leaks and device-related thrombus and the challenges of fitting devices to the enormous anatomical variability, uh, some of the, the problems. And there is a, a, a a device to device trial, which is an interesting way of launching uh, the amulet that's going on, that is a randomized uh, trial looking at three primary endpoints the safety, the clinical efficacy, and the device efficacy being the focus of those primary endpoints. And that trial's enrollment has come along quite well. So, in conclusion, uh, they it really are two therapies in the initial period of routine use in clinical practice that has, you really see how many years it takes for new therapies to get out there. Uh, we have two PFO closure devices, one LAA. Um, and, but recall, these are very targeted therapies and much of your evaluation in, in the PFO realm in terms of the um, how confident are you that the index stroke was a paradoxical embolism goes to the, the, the foundation here. And uh, these are fairly narrowly defined clinical indications because of the way the randomized clinical trials were organized, but there are uh, some more clinical trials coming. Uh, we always have to be careful for kind of pushing the boundaries, especially in these therapies that are really preventative therapies. They're not going to make people feel better. And we're gathering much more data with left atrial appendage than in PFO closure in real world because there's no uh, registry linked to PFO closure. And uh, growth is uh, different. For, for me, uh, once we optimize the use in patients after probable paradoxical embolic strokes with PFO closure, uh, migraines really the other area, the left atrial appendage, I think as many of the uh, occluded areas, as many of the speakers have pointed out, has a variety of ways of, of really hopefully enhancing improvement patient care because of the uh, high frequency of AFib and all the different subgroups that need to be um, considered in the future. Thank you. We're a little over time. Any final thoughts, comments from the audience or the panel? Uh, I just had a question. Uh, I think is Mario still here? Or oh, maybe Dr. Carl can chime in. The, uh, we have two devices for PFO occlusion. Uh, occlu uh, occlusion. Are there any anatomic criteria that will make you choose one over the other? Well. Uh, uh, that's great. I think there are some anatomical subsets where we just don't have either device really fitting that niche. One of them being the very lipomatous septum secundum, where it's so thick that it's hard for these devices uh, to uh, hang around. And the other is the very large uh, PFO that when you're doing, whether you do balloon sizing or with a wire opened up the septum primum, where it's 20, 25. Uh, millimeters, uh, should you go to an ASO device where you risk erosion, or perhaps it's where uh, the new Gore ASD device may play a, a role in. Um, other thoughts of uh, preferred device? What are your thoughts in terms of? Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have a specific anatomic criteria. Um, obviously, uh, if it's fairly large tunnel, I may prefer a softer device. Uh, to kind of reduce the risk of compression or reverse future erosions, uh, but I, I don't really have a specific anatomic criteria. I was wondering if anybody had guidance on the panel. Mm. I have one question for that's, uh, Dr. Huber. That was uh, an amazing talk, and while you downplayed the administrative thing, I was struck by the cost of of devices. Is that different in the U.S.? Because that's one thing we've noticed about TAVR devices is that we're paying two to three times what's paid in Europe. Is that the same uh, with uh, appendage devices? Um, I believe it is, but I'm huh? not 100 percent sure. I think it's a little bit different in Europe because they have other alternatives, and yeah. so the dynamics there are, are, are very different. But I I don't mean to underplay the economics of it. They're very real, but uh, I think you have to be sensitive to that, and it's very regionally uh, diverse. Mm 
I think we're going to be displaced by lunch here. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, everyone.